Hi everybody, this is Philip Martin, and this is On Film on Video. We're back after a week off. A week off, because not because I actually took it off, but a, be, a week off because I didn't think that what I recorded last week was worth putting out there. I don't know if you guys have this problem or not. And if you do have this problem or not, you probably don't have any sympathy with me because you probably have to go ahead and, you know, do your job. But uh, I just didn't think I did a very good job, so I didn't put the video out there. All right? I don't even remember now what I was talking about. It couldn't have been too important. So let's not, let's not worry about it. But we're back this week, and we're back this week. You know, and this takes me by surprise. I'm really sort of... I haven't seen the film yet, and I don't generally comment on movies I haven't seen. That's not a good way to go about reviewing a film. But I've just read two reviews, two of our reviews. Courtney uh, Lanning has written a column, and uh, Piers Marchant has written a, a review, what I would call a straighter review. But it's, it's, you know, he reviewed it. Courtney wrote a column reacting to the film, which is slightly different. There's not a whole lot of difference between that and that. But they work together well, I think. And so we're making that the lead of this week's section. And this movie must be extraordinary because of the ways both of these writers responded to it. And Piers' piece is basically just said, oh, wow, you need to go see this. Go see it now. Go see it before somebody ruins it for you. Uh, Courtney's piece is, wow, I really needed this movie at this particular time. And uh, you can read their pieces and, and put together and know as much about the movie as I know. I know a few things about it. Um... Haven't seen it. Intend on seeing it. It's first opportunity. By the time you're watching this, I hope to have seen it. Let's put it that way. Um, so, but that's not what I was going to talk about this week. What I was going to talk about this week is just the... It's so good and rich out there right now. The, uh, the television environment that I'm watching. You know, what we do... It's like one night a week we set it aside for movie night, and we generally are watching uh, a classic movie, an older movie, something you know from the seventies or eighties or fifties, forties that uh, either we haven't seen before, or we it's been a long time since I've seen them. I've been I, I've, I've talked a lot about those movies now. What we watched last week was a really interesting movie from nineteen eighty five uh, by a director named Joyce Chopra called Sweet Talk, and it's it's a weird movie. If you haven't seen it, it's really strange, and uh, it's it's not Laura Dern's first movie, but it's Laura Dern, who's, I think, 17 when she made this movie, plays a 15-year-old in it, you know, and it's sort of an interesting dynamic, especially if you've grown up with Laura, Laura Dern, and you know her now as a you know, as, as what she is, a 55-year-old uh, woman who's still turning in some really good performances and is really, you know, uh, really a draw for, especially for, you know, a certain audience, people like me who um, like the sort of material she chooses. I really wanted to do my um, last class on her series Enlightened, which she did with Mike White, um, on HBO back in 10 years ago now, 2011, 2012, is when I think the first two seasons ran. Um, I don't think there was a third season. I think there only were two seasons. But anyway, I wanted to talk about that. But to go back in time and see her as a, as a young woman and to see her playing an even younger woman, and it's a, it's a strange film. If you don't know Sweet Talk, and why would you? It's on the Criterion collection. They actually have put out a DVD of it uh, I, fairly recently, I think. And I remember it more from seeing the DVD cover than I do from 1985, because I do not remember it at all from back then. When, when I was a very active moviegoer, and I went to see movies on a weekly basis, I wasn't quite writing about them yet. It would be the next year, a Platoon, that I'd start actually professionally writing about the films. The films, yeah, writing about the films professionally, 1986. Yeah, that's what I started. Um, but I'm surprised I'm not, you know, conversant with it. I mean, I did not know anything about it. I just knew 
that it was a criterion thing. Uh, Treat Williams, uh, Laura Dern, Levon Helm. Levon Helm is there. Uh, so it's even stranger that I did not was not familiar with this film. Anyway, it's based on a Joyce, uh, Joyce Carol Oates um, short story that is in turn based on a real life um, killer in Tucson, Arizona. Now, I haven't read the short story. I don't think. If I have, it was a long time ago, and I didn't put it together with this with this movie. Um, but I have seen the movie just recently, and the movie is very creepy. What it's about, it's almost like it's almost like a uh, American graffiti sort of thing. It's set in not that it needs to be set here. In fact, I thought when we started watching it, it might be set in someplace like South Carolina, but it's actually set in uh, Northern California, uh, I think north of San Francisco, near the coast, a little town near Petaluma, uh, and Laura Dern is a 15-year-old uh, sophomore in high school, rising sophomore. She's going to be a sophomore in high school, and she has two friends, uh, one who's younger, I suppose, who's just starting high school the next year, and the other who's her equal. And what you see is that she's at that age where she's starting to get ideas and get interested and want to hang around with guys, with boys, and maybe fool around with boys in a sort of exploratory way. I mean, she's by no means a bad girl, but it's, she does things like tells her mother she's going to the movies or going to the mall, and she doesn't do that. She goes to places where she can like flirt and talk to boys and sometimes make out and her younger friend can't quite keep up with, with the other two girls you know the other two girls are a little older a little a bit more access they can go places that she really can't none of them are old enough to drive which is kind of important anyway she's at this place one night and uh, an older guy Treat Williams driving a Pontiac Le Mans, Le Mans uh, notices her, and he makes a point of pointing to her and says, I see you, I, I've noticed you, whatever. Okay. Uh, she continues to kind of do the sneaking around in this sort of innocent way. I mean, it's sort of like in this way that, um, you know, you could get in trouble. <laughs> but, you know, she's not, there's not really anything desperate or sordid about it. It's just sort of the normal sort of teenage experience. And then one day, you know, Levon and her older sister, uh, who looks younger, and uh, <laughs> which is sort of confusing because her older sister does look younger than her in this, and her mother, uh, Mary Kay Place, Mary Kay Place plays her mother. That's, you know, and that takes me back to that uh, big chill sort of era because, you know, there's, it's funny because, you know, sort of gotten used to the idea of Mary Kay Place uh, being an older character actor, you know, being middle aged and up. And to bring her back to where she's probably in her 30s, I'm sure she's, you know, in her 30s and to, to, to see her again and to go, yeah, that's right. I remember her in all these other roles where she was this person and not the person I think of now as Mary Kay Place, which has got to be a really weird thing for somebody who's an actor who's had a long career and has had been popular or at least been in popular movies throughout that career because you can kind of look back and see yourself at different stages of your time. I mean, it's, it's different. I don't know if it's different, you know, but one of the things that as a writer, there's somebody who's had, you know, I can go back and look at stuff uh, that I did in the 80s, say, or the 90s, and I can look at them and I can go, well, that's not very good, or, that's embarrassing, and every once in a while something will come up that will, will surprise me with how good I think it is, but it doesn't feel like something I did. I mean, I can even remember sometimes having written these things, but they still don't feel 
like something I have done. It's like something I've encountered. You know, it's 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 reading something alien to me. It's like somebody else wrote it because, in fact, someone else did. It was me at a different stage of my life, a different set of. I wonder how it is for someone like Mary Kay Place to look back on her own performances and to, whether I, I would imagine it would be very hard for most people to go back and watch themselves on camera. I don't go back and watch myself on camera except to the extent I have to kind of make sure this video doesn't like have something horrible happen in the middle of it which sometimes it does and I don't see it and Nick finds it. Thank you. Um, but anyway, it's just this weird thing. So, they're going to the barbecue, and there's this, obviously, the tension, mother and daughter tension. The older, older, um, older daughter is Miss Perfect, of course, and mom likes her, and she's got a job, and she's, you know, helping out all the time, where Laura Dern's character is very lazy. <laughs> very much a 15-year-old, you know, girl who's got her head in the clouds a lot of the time. Um... And then the movie happens. The real movie starts when they go to the barbecue. Levon takes the rest of the family off on a Sunday afternoon to a barbecue at a relative's house. And Treat Williams shows up at uh, Laura Dern's house. And he knows all this stuff about her that we're not sure how he knows it. And he's got this creepy guy with him who seems to be just kind of his helper. And he's kind of like his his toady and the only thing the guy says the whole movie is like do you want me to cut the lines speaking about the phone lines and Treat Williams has this weird dialogue with Laura Dern where he's trying to convince her to go for a ride with him in his car they can you know take off and he's going to be her lover and she knows it and you know and she reacts the way you would expect someone to react and this goes on for and he's talking to her the screen door and she moves away and he opens the screen door and you get this really creepy sense of vulnerability I mean it's sort of and then you find out as I did if you if you're the kind of person who finds this sort of stuff out that it was based on the Oat story, which was based on a real life, you know, Tucson murder case where a guy came and, you know, convinced I, he and his girlfriend convinced her to go out with someone else and they all went on a double date and they took her to the desert. Anyway, that's not what happens here. But it is intensely creepy and intensely strange. And I am shaken by this movie in a way I'm not really sure I should be. I mean, Karen sort of took it like, well, you know, this isn't plausible, that isn't plausible, and she's right. And, you know, you wouldn't do this, you wouldn't do that. And But at the same time, you know, you have to kind of buy into the premise of the movie. And the premise of the movie is that Treat Williams, Arnold Friend in the movie, a friend is this sort of very smooth talking get back to the title uh, character who's not exactly overtly threatening her though he does at one point seem to suggest that he's going to burn her house down if she doesn't come with it and they go for the ride we don't know exactly what happens on that ride. She comes back. And her family's there. And she's shaken. She's obviously disturbed. But she sort of reintegrates into that family. And that's sort of the end. And it doesn't... I mean, maybe I've sounded like I've spoiled it. I really haven't. I mean, really, the, the you really have to watch those scenes between Laura Dern and Treat Williams, and maybe that's all you need watch, you know. But it's it's just a fascinating, you know, little movie, the kind of movie that they really do not make at all anymore. So, yeah. 
we get distracted. That was on. It was actually on the Criterion Channel, um, which is another one of the streaming services I subscribed to. I did a survey the other day about streaming services, and you know, they said, "Do you subscribe to this?" Yes. Showtime, HBO, yes, yes. Uh, Sundance, yes. Acorn, yes. Apple TV Plus, yes. H. That's mention HBO. Uh, all of them, basically. Netflix, Hulu, got them all, basically. I mean, there's some I don't have Paramount. But I've been able to somehow see some of Paramount stuff. Disney, I have Disney, which I don't really use a whole lot. Uh, and I'm not suggesting you should have a bunch of these. I mean, it's sort of like, this is my job. I mean, I can sort of... I, I can... I can... Um, yeah, I take these off my taxes. Even though that doesn't really work anymore since they've changed the tax code. It does help with the state taxes. Which is another thing that was, I was, that maybe that's why I couldn't get last week's video done to my satisfaction because I was preoccupied with doing our taxes. Maybe that's it. Anyway, but, you know, I just want to talk about what we're watching now. I mean, we're watching the show Julia, which I didn't think would be any good. I mean, I didn't see last year's Julia movie. There was a movie about Julia Child. Last year, right? Unless is that a Mandela effect? Is that like it wasn't one, and maybe I'm just imagining it, or or maybe they've I've slipped through some rent in the fabric of the universe? I don't know, but I remember the Meryl Streep one, the Meryl Streep movie very well, and then I think there was one last year, which I didn't see because it was a kind of a streaming movie, and I didn't get a screener of it, and you know these things get lost in the in the thing. But then this series shows up. And it's got uh, this woman, Sarah Lancaster, or Lancashire. And I've seen her before, and I've watched her in several things. And she was in brilliant in this uh, British film, uh, British series a few years ago called Happy Valley, where she played this tough, uh, kind of slipping down police detective in uh, the Midlands, in, in in the UK. And it was a it was a really don't really remember much of it. I just remember it was a really gritty, tough show. And she was wonderful in that. And now she's wonderful as Julia Child in this sort of effervescent, refreshing kind of 43-minute, you know, hit we get every once in a while that shows that right now, you know, it's the beginning of Julia Child's television career after she's published The Art of French Cooking. And uh, she's starting to... Um, do the show on WGB, uh, WGBH in, in Boston, the public, which I guess I don't have, I'm not up on my public television history, but I would think that's a big landmark in uh, public broadcasting. I would think that and Sesame Street would be two big things, you know, I mean, so, and, and it's, David, um, David Hyde Pierce is in it, and it's just sort of a fascinating, I guess it's a dramedy, because it's not, you know, funny, funny, but it's funny in the way it's a character-driven comedy. Is what is more what I would say about it. I mean, it's sort of it's a little exaggerated, but it's really close to the world we actually inhabit. And the period stuff, which I really get a kick out of, of uh, seeing the cars and the clothes and the accoutrements, the the radios, the television sets of the early 60s is really sort of, uh, it's, it's a kick for me, okay? Um, it's not deeply involving on some sort of intellectual level like, say, uh, the Apple series Severance, which I've just finished, and kind of do figure, I, I kind of felt like I was lost throughout most of the series, and then it sort of cohered at the end. I go, okay, I kind of get it. I kind of... And I'm waiting for series two of that, season two. And that was, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, uh, ben Stiller uh, directed that. I, and, and I guess he directed most of those episodes. And he didn't appear in it. So I think that's that was a really... If you've got Apple TV, I would recommend that. I'd also recommend uh, Slow Horses, which is uh, the new Gary Oldman uh, kind of spy thriller which we're only a little bit into, but it's uh, it's interesting because it's about the opposite of this, 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 
debonair James Bond suave spies. These are the bottom of the barrel spies who are relegated to a place called Slow House in London, and they, you know, kind of do all the. Well, they're they're kind of trash collectors. They don't get good assignments. They have to kind of kowtow to the real spies and stuff like that. But uh, it's getting really interesting and. I don't know how to talk about these things without revealing plot points, so I just won't. And we're watching, and Severance kind of fits into this. We're kind of watching all the bad entrepreneur shows. And I'm not uh, the Uber show, whose name I can't forget. We sort of, we still are tuning into that. I like um, uh, Joseph Gordon Levitt and the role as Travis Kalanick, the Uber founder. And it's sort of interesting to see these recent headlines kind of play out on the screen. And to the extent that they use real people and real names and real institutions is sort of interesting to me. It's very interesting to me. Uh, I'm not watching the Elizabeth Holmes ones, the Theranos, which I didn't follow that story as closely. So maybe we'll get into that later. Um, we Crash is another one with two Oscar winners, Jared Leto and uh, Anne Hathaway in the leads. And... Jared Leto, a lot of people who don't know Israeli accents have said, have complained about his accent in that film, or that series. It's perfect. I mean, I don't know how he did it. I don't know, I don't really have the credibility to say this, but it sounds right to my ear, and I know a lot of people who are familiar with that accent agree with me. And you can, I, I mean, it's part of it is this vicarious, you know, living the billionaire life, and it really feels sort of more like a show like Billions than it does a docudrama. You know, I mean, I know it's based on true events, but I mean, nobody's that articulate, nobody's that. Same thing with Inven Inventing Anna, which is a Shonda Rhimes uh, production, and I've never been a big Shonda Rhimes fan. Excuse me, I just haven't until this show. And Inventing Anna is the you know story of the fake German heiress Anna um, Sorokin or Sorokina or Anna Delvey as uh, the name she um, she adopted, and it is quasi fictionalized. I mean, I, I can tell at some places where things have been fictionalized, where names have been changed, but some names haven't been changed, which is another, like I said, this is really interesting to me. It draws me back into the reporting of the story, the way it was reported and what was going on at the time, but it kind of extends beyond what was reported in the well, famously in the New Yorker story, which is what it's based on now. It's Manhattan Magazine. They changed the writer's name, you know, blah, blah. Uh, but it's, it, it is, it is fascinating. And the um, lead actress, um, what's her name? Warren, uh, <laughs> who plays Ruth. <laughs> Julia Garner. <laughs> Julia Garner is amazing. And again, this is another case of, Really, it's more of an impersonation than it is a, an acting performance. I think she studied the existing video of Anna Delvey, if that's what she wants to call herself. Let's call her that. Um, and has got these, you know, these this very strange accent just down. This uh, accent that doesn't really sound like it comes from anywhere. It sounds like it's made up. And they managed to make her look like her, and it's interesting that Garner, who you know is so good in Ozark and was so good in uh, The Assistant last year, um, she really brings you into this character. She really, you really do feel empathetic for this really horrible person. I mean, this is sort of like the theater of horrible people. It's sort of like, I have not watched, like I said, I haven't watched the Elizabeth Holmes thing. But the We Crash couple, God. Ooh, they're just awful. You know, walking around their bare feet. Travis Kalanick, ah! Ugh, oh, he's just a terrible person. And Anna Delvey, who might be, who's the one that's in jail? 
You know, these others aren't in jail. Let's just think about that. They aren't in jail. She's the most parsable, the most understandable character of all these. And in real life, I don't have any idea. I mean, it's like I'm just saying that, uh, you know, Julia Garner's performance is, is really good in this show. As is Jared Leto's, and as is, I think, Anne Hathaway's, though they're in service of a different sort of thing, a different sort of idea. Um, anyway, anyway, that's about all I want to talk about. I want to talk about Sweet Talk. Is it Sweet Talk or Smooth Talk? I think it's... Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I can't look it up. Uh, stuck here. Oh, anyway, Sweet Talk, I believe. And uh, it's a really interesting movie from 1985 that you probably haven't seen. And all these other things which you probably are watching are really interesting. And we'll be back uh, next week. Zero mistakes. Take care.